Hi, this is Brian Kim. I'm going to share with you case number 26 in the best way to do cataract surgery series. This is a patient who has floppy iris syndrome. I'm going to show you how, despite using epinephrine and viscodilation, this patient's pupil came down quite a bit, but using mechanical fracturing, double chop, cross chop, using only mechanical forces to break up and disassemble the lens, I was able to remove this lens very carefully, very safely, and despite the iris coming towards the tip, I'm able to gently disengage it and resume the case without needing any iris retractors, rings, or hooks. So I use a corneal mark to help me center and size my rexus. I use a cotton tip to turn the eye so I can make the blade flat and parallel to the iris plane, creating that corneal shelf. By doing this, I can ensure a self-sealing corneal incision. I'm injecting lidocaine and epinephrine going around circumferentially, making sure that the epinephrine is contacting the iris well. I'm using dispersive viscoelastic to viscodilate the pupil. Using the cannula, I use it to hold the eye so I can do my triplanar corneal incision. I make a vertical groove, go into the groove, and then tunnel through the cornea. And then when I'm ready, I dive down and then enter the anterior chamber. This is my triplanar corneal incision and I'm doing this with the control of my cannula. I'm doing a puncture style capsule rexus. I puncture the center and then I pull down. And as I pull down, I try to pull a little bit to the right to create a little bit of a flap. As I create that flap, I'm able to go around circumferentially following the corneal marks, which help me center and size my rexus. As I begin to go around circumferentially, I notice that the iris begins to start coming down. And so, you can tell that this means the pupil was big primarily because of the viscodilation, not because it was stable itself. Because as the viscoelastic comes out during the rexus, the pupil became smaller. I'm going to begin my capsular fornix hydrodissection technique, place the cannula out flat to the contralateral equator underneath the anterior capsule rexus edge out to the capsular fornix, turn the tip downward, and then you get a nice fluid wave. This pupil is very small, so you have to just trust your technique. I decompress on the left side and begin to spin the lens on the right side. I like to turn the tip slightly downward, which helps me engage the endonucleus and spin the lens. I'm gonna lift my incision and then go in with irrigation off to minimize sesame's trauma. And then I'm gonna to start to remove the epinuclear surface material. This allows me to create the epinuclear ridge. I'm able to place a chopper underneath the epinuclear ridge out to the capsular fornix, turning the chopper vertically. I place the phaco tip more vertically in the subincisional space and I crush the lens material in half. I place the chopper out to the contralateral equator, pull it centrally, and this crushes the right hemineucleus. And now I have three separate pieces. You can see here, I'm gonna go after one quadrant here, and you can see the iris flies into the tip because of the vacuum, despite being nowhere near the tip during this maneuver. And so the benefit of this technique is I don't have to use high ultrasonic energy and risk damaging the iris with the technique. I can just use vacuum and mechanical fracturing forces using the chopper to control the iris so it doesn't come to the tip, and I don't have to use any pupil expansion devices. So you can see this pupil is extremely unstable. And so I'm gonna turn the suction off. So with each chop maneuver, in these cases, you just turn the vacuum off and then pull the pieces out of the bag. Because I don't have to rely on the phaco tip to use vacuum to pull pieces out of the bag, which is much more dangerous, I'm able to just mechanically prolapse those pieces out of the bag using the chopper. You can see I pulled that second quadrant out of the bag using the chopper and then I'm just very carefully removing it using high vacuum. I turn that second hemineucleus in front of me, place the chopper out to the equator, crush the lens piece between the chopper and the finger tip. I'm using a little bit of vacuum here to pull that third quadrant out of the bag gently. I'm using the chopper to keep that subincisional iris away from me to make sure it doesn't come to the tip. And so I'm just gently trying to pull and crush the piece, that third quadrant. I'm using mechanical fracturing forces to kind of crush that piece and then gently teasing it mechanically and then using some vacuum as well. You can see it did grab the iris again, but because I'm using the chopper to hold the iris, I'm able to minimize any trauma to that subincisional iris. 
So you want to use that chopper to hold the iris back. And then now that third quadrant has been emulsified. I'm placing the chopper out to the equator again, crushing that fourth quadrant. Again, I'm using the chopper to kind of hold that iris back and then very gently and in the central safe zone, I'm using the high vacuum to emulsify the lens piece. So you can see you have to keep that fakir tip in the central safe zone. You don't want to deviate out of the central safe zone. This is a very small central safe zone and a small pupil with floppy iris. And as I do this, I'm able to use ultrasonic energy and vacuum to remove the lens pieces. And then I'm using vacuum to prolapse the epinucleus out of the bag. And then I'm making sure that the tip is nowhere near the iris. And that's why I have my chopper in place to keep that subincisional iris out of the way. I pull the iris back and I'm able to get that last piece of epinucleus. I then push BSS into the anterior chamber. But as I pull the finger tip out, you see I can gently remove that tip, making sure that the iris wasn't gonna come with it. I switch to the INA handpiece, pushing BSS with a cannula to maintain some chamber stability. I start with a subincisional iris, but you can see the iris wants to come to the tip. I'm able to find that subincisional cortical material and then sweep it out. And this is all about positioning. I'm able to go right up the cortical material very gently, making sure I'm avoiding the iris and I'm going around circumferentially, grabbing the cortex from the anterior side and peeling it out. Because the visibility is poor, you don't want to just go with high vacuum. You only want to initiate high vacuum once you know that you have the cortical piece in hand. When you're going up to the piece, you'll have to be very ginger, just activate with a little bit of vacuum, and then once you engage the cortex, you can go with high vacuum. And I switched to polish mode here because the visibility is poor underneath the anterior capsule, and because of this very floppy iris, I like to just go straight to the polish mode. I don't want to accidentally grab the capsule as I'm going underneath the anterior capsule because if I grab the capsule, I can grab the zonules, and because I have poor visibility, I think this is not really a very good technique. I'm pushing BSS, and I'm trying to pulse some BSS into the capsule or fornix to see if there's any dust bunnies. I didn't have any here. I inject some cohesive elastic to open up the bag and open up the pupil. I don't like sweeping in this case as well because with poor visibility, I might just cause more iris trauma or even damage the capsule of the zonule. So I go straight to the lens and I'm injecting this single piece of acrylic lens into the capsular bag. And then I go straight to the IA. But as I do this, I also go with the Maltzman and I'm disengaging each haptic, the leading and then the trailing haptic. I like to use this Maltzman because it really helps me make sure I am definitely in the bag completely because of the limited view from this small pupil. As I turn the lens, you can see, lo and behold, the lens is not turning right. And so I figured this lens is not completely in the bag. And lo and behold, you can see the trailing haptic is not in the bag. And so that's why that, that 90 degree clockwise rotation is very helpful because otherwise that lens should tilt and turn very easily and that did not happen in this case. So I was able to tuck that trailing haptic right into the bag. I'm able to tilt this lens, go underneath the lens, remove the viscoelastic from within the bag, and then I'm going to remove the viscoelastic in the anterior chamber. I'm very confident that the lens is completely in the bag because I was able to use a Maltzman to visualize that the lens was completely in the bag and then I'm removing all the viscoelastic in the anterior chamber. Because I use viscoat, I have to be very careful, make sure all the viscoat is out of the anterior chamber as well as out of the angle. As I pull the INA out, I wanna disengage irrigation and then I pull out. And then I hydrate my incisions. So you can see this is a very, very small pupil, very unstable iris. You can use mechanical fracturing forces, using the chopper to grab the pieces, pull them out of the bag, and keeping the fingertip in a very small central safe zone. By doing this, you're able to minimize iris trauma. And you could see that if I did this traditional technique where you grab the pieces with the fingertip using high vacuum, it would have been disastrous. You would have caused a lot of trauma unnecessarily. And in this case, because you're using careful technique, the technique trumps the iris. You don't have to use hooks, rings, or any devices like that. I hope this was helpful to you. Please like and subscribe, and I thank you for your attention.